We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings and welcome from Tbilisi, Georgia. This is Burn Power, the anatomist, coming to you on a warm, the end of the warm season here. It's been quite intense for this uh, soul who has been spent the last 22 years in the summer in Haines, Alaska, which is a wonderful place to spend the summer. By contrast here, a uh, half hour walk uh, to go shopping or an hour walk to go shopping and to come back yesterday, uh, especially coming back up the hill, about 10 floors worth of climb in about five minutes. Well, that was kind of sweaty and hot. So greetings. If you hear again, the random sounds, I can hear them. I don't know if you will, but I hear a little bit of construction work. Uh, they're doing some excavating on the hill and then there's the occasional squealing of children I hear that are playing around. Uh, maybe they've gone inside. Maybe they'll come back out. And also uh, the occasional cat, although they're all napping in the heat. The good news is it's going down by about 10, 20 degrees within a week. I am so happy. I am ready for all the rest of the season. It's funny, in Alaska, there was a couple of months in the winter... I didn't live in the super cold part of Alaska, but there were a couple of months in the winter, particularly January, February, where um, you just kind of hunkered down and stayed in most of the time, unless you got lucky and you got some good weather. Here, it's the other way around. It's uh, The rest of the year is great. It's just July and August, particularly. It hasn't dipped uh, below 30 Celsius, around 90 Fahrenheit, for about two months now. So I am ready for the change. But, you know, I've adjusted. I'm here. And uh, which reminds me, before we get into our discussion on time today, hey, do subscribe and do uh, share this video if you like it. And also remember this. Um, I really am benefiting from the few people who have uh, gone through PayPal and signed up for either a monthly subscription or a... Uh, a one-time offer, and those people have received uh, extra content already, about seven hours worth, and you could receive that same content uh, if you become a subscriber. One-time donation of about $50 or, uh, or even if you just do a one-time donation of less, I'll probably pass some stuff on to you, um, or at least $10 a month uh, for at least a year, you'll get at least 15 hours of extra content uh, in the near future. So, okay, enough business, time. And it's funny, time and business run together these days. But we've discussed how time essentially is something we experience in a personal way, and we're not done discussing that. But I also wanted to stress how and I did this last time, how time is not the clock, but that is the temptation that everybody has, is to make time the clock and to say, well, it's going around a certain amount. That time is the, the clock is the measurement of time. It is not the time. It is not time itself. Any more than history is the past. History is our way of remembering the past, but so much of the past is absolutely lost to us. For instance, yesterday, uh, so much of what I did yesterday will be lost to me. Why? Because 
you know, I could describe to you in a few sentences what I did yesterday. I just did when I mentioned walking up the hill and going shopping. And what a hot, warm day that was. But um, if I was to really tell you everything I did yesterday, how I woke up, I was kind of sweaty. It was about 7.30 in the morning. I went over, turned the air conditioning on. Fortunately, you know, the electrical costs here are ridiculously cheap. Uh, then I went into the bathroom, I urinated, I then went back in. Oh yeah, let's get some clothes on at a certain point here. I went and checked the internet to see if I had any messages. You know, and you go on and on and on. Now, you know, I just, that's kind of like, uh, first thing in the morning. One nice thing is I got a, a lovely, uh, email from the Quay brothers who make, uh, these really, interesting, uh, uh, really cryptic puppet films uh, saying that they had watched my lecture on conceptual humanity and they really loved it, which I wasn't expecting. So that was great. So, you know, that's the thing I will remember from yesterday more than anything. I'll also remember the fact that it's getting near the end of the summer. But anyway, it's our personal uh, investiture in time and how we relate to it. But the point is, the past disappears. Because who can remember all that little stuff? I mean, who remembers every time they brush their teeth? Nobody. It's just impossible. You wouldn't want to. But nevertheless, you do want to live in, in such a way that, that there is a fullness to your time that you can remember, in a sense, your history. Uh, and history being the thing that we document, the thing that stands out. And we'll get to discussing history in the past and memory again in a few uh, episodes of our time series here. But today, we're going to stay on the clock for a minute. We're going to have a brief history of clocks. Now, again, I'm not a scientist. I am not uh, an academic. I am not a philosopher. I am not a specialist. However, I have been thinking about these things for a while, seriously, since 1993. That is when these ideas first came. And in fact, most of these notes here are from my lecture in 1993, which I've expanded a bit. So first of all, time. Before the clock, before anything else, we have natural time. And natural time involves that thing outside which is making me so hot, the sun. And it involves the way the sun goes around the world, and secondarily, the way the moon goes around the world, and how it creates seasons. So naturally, people in different time zones, well, not time zones, because that's a later development, but we'll say equatorial uh, versus polar zones, uh, different uh, latitude lines, are going to experience the seasons very differently. For instance, someone living in Barrow, Alaska, is going to look at the summer extraordinarily different from someone living in Lima, Peru. Nevertheless... And that is actually one of the effects of time. That, that is what I mean, that n nothing in time experiences time the same way, even when they seem like they're right next to each other. Uh, and we will discuss this down the road, this effect. But natural time involves the sun and the seasons. And all traditional cultures rotated in some way or another around the sun and the seasons. In places like India, where the weather, particularly in the, the middle of the uh, subcontinent, is more or less uh, warm, they go by the monsoon season versus the dry season. And the dry season is super dry, and the monsoon season is super wet. Uh, so those are how they keep their time. That's traditional. And, of course, they still do. Uh, and, of course, now you have all the news media surrounding it saying, you know, oh, my goodness, here comes, <laughs> you know, the monsoon season. It's going to be a wet one this year. And we get down to the micro detail about it with our climatology and our satellite uh, photos and everything else. But traditionally, people had a calendar, uh, lived on calendar time. And calendar time was very naturally broken into, it's related to the moon as well. Uh, it's not exactly the moon, and so there's a difference between a, a lunar calendar and a solar calendar. Nevertheless, um, the calendar is a particularly interesting achievement because it really does kind of correlate to the months of the year and to the 
plus cycle of the rotation of the sun. Now, to live in calendar time, which I find people here in Georgia do much more than anyone in America than I've ever met, although in Alaska we certainly did pay attention to the seasons, and I think in a way much more so than I did growing up in California or living in New York City. In New York City, you know, it's always essentially, uh, it's cold, it's hot, but essentially you're living in architecture time, <laughs> you know, because it's, you're surrounded by architecture, you're not surrounded by the sun. The, the, the architecture is so tall, it blots out the effects of the sun. But um, in Alaska, we knew exactly where we were on the calendar, you know, uh, uh, except like I say, in the middle of the of the winter, you kind of get lost a bit. But essentially, you know, you would know, like, oh, we're at the beginning of the summer. We're at the, you know, the peak of the summer. We're in the fading part of the summer. We're in the bear season, the, the salmon season. We're in the, you know, the hooligan are running now. These little fish about the, this big, about the size of, uh, know, they're pretty tasty and oily. But, uh, uh, you know, it's the beginning of the spring, whenever they come in. Now, they don't come in the same day every year. And that's what calendar time is like. Calendar time isn't about repetition. Calendar time is the way things unfold. And now you did get the Babylonians and uh, they started to mark things off. There's a whole interesting uh, relationship between astronomy and astrology, which I'm not going to get into. Interestingly enough, our astrology today is essentially a remnant of Babylonian religion, which we got from the Persians who conquered Babylon and they got it, uh, the Greeks went and conquered Persia and essentially brought this system into the West. And, you know, there are other astrological systems, obviously, as well. But, uh, interestingly enough, one of the people today who really keeps time uh, and schedules the best are the Germans or the Germanic people, including the Swiss and the Dutch, uh, and and in uh, the Nordic countries and such. But the Germanic tribes uh, used to fight the Romans. Now, the Romans, back in the day, they kept time better than anyone. It was calendar time, but they also had their sundials, which is a precursor to the kind of clock time we're going to be talking about. But the Germanic tribes were, were seen to be so flexible in their time back in the Roman era that the Romans would say, you know, if they had to have a, a parlay with the uh, Germanic tribes, the Romans would say, well, they might hear, be here two days earlier or two days later than when they said they just couldn't trust the Germans in relationship to time, which I think is really funny considering what the Germans are like, you know, these uh, 1,500 years or more later. So um, let's talk a little bit about the origins of the clock. Clock comes from the Latin cloga. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. That's my Latin. And uh, cloga meant bell. Now, what's interesting is that essentially the clock comes from the bell, which is fascinating. We think it's probably the other way around, but it's not. And I'll tell you why. First of all, let's discuss what the meaning of bells are. Bells in the West have a very specific kind of function. They were to mark the times of the day uh, for prayer within the Christian circle. Um, the bells have, the, we call these the canonical hours, uh, which the Christian church derived from the Jewish traditions of having certain times for reciting prayers during the day. So the bell, however, was a little device where it started off in monasteries that they could ring the bell and the monks would know, oh, it's time now. For instance, some of these canonical hours included, um, you know, they were broken down like this. The early morning, the first hour of daylight, the third hour, noon, uh, the ninth hour, sunset, evening, the end of the day is night times. And we still occasionally hear some of the Latin words for these, like vespers, would be an evening sunset service at church. Matins were the middle of the night. Uh, we still hear some of these words today. But the point was this. It was the ringing of the bells, because how would they know, how would the monks know when to do what? Well, all together. Well, 
a bell would ring and they would go like, oh, it's that time. And of course they had different bells for different times. Um, but the, the, the bell then became this very interesting musical device, which even today, when you're walking by a place that has bells, still tugs at you. And it says, come. And it also says, come and pray. And uh, most people today don't hear the prayer part, but there's something about the sound of the bell. And I know I live across from a uh, an Orthodox church here, and I hear these bells. It just turned midnight. Orthodox Easter morning. And these bells on the Russian church just started going, but there are other bells going too. There are probably bells all over the city and dogs howling. Amazing. What's interesting about their bells, they're all hand rung. They're not on a machine at all. And you can sometimes see the guy in the tower ringing the bells. And of course, the Orthodox tradition has this same uh, use of bells, although in a different way, for keeping the, the times of the day. Now, how would you know the time of the day? Well, you did have a sundial, but more importantly, you had a sense of, of when the day was. So, so for instance, if you were living in uh, Germany in the year 1400, your sense of when the evening was would probably be different in the winter than it was in the summer, because Germany is at a fairly high latitude. So these were not uh, clock times yet. These were general times. They were the times of the day, the sun, the calendar. Okay, so now medieval bell ringing eventually starts becoming public bell ringing. You can think of the town crier, you know, who would go along the city streets and ring his bell and to let everyone know it's a certain time of the night. Now, that already assumes there's a clock. The first clocks, uh, the whole point was to have a device which hit the times and let you know what time it was. The first clocks had no minute hand, certainly no second hand. Uh, they simply went around and struck the hours. Now, I won't get into the technical uh, inventions of these clocks. Uh, it took a while. Uh, late Middle Ages, uh, clock technology was invented. Um, like I said, the early public clocks, and they were public. You had to put them on a big tower, which is why clock uh, uh, bell towers almost always have a clock on them. Um, is because you needed to know what time it was. This was a civic function for people carrying on their, their, uh, tasks during the day. Now, obviously, um, a bell in a church is a very different kind of a timekeeping than an alarm on your watch. The alarm on your watch screams at you, but the bell, uh, kind of just says it's now this time, and especially when they count off the times. And um, I like the 12 hour clock because noon is right on top. And that's, I think that relates to the sundial. But um, interestingly enough, the introduction of the minute hand only happened a little bit before the year 1700 in Europe. And that starts to change the way, uh, for instance, that uh, clocks sounded. If you've ever been around a clock that keeps the time of day, you will notice that for, on the top of the hour, you'll get the, the, uh, the hour gongs. So you hear, you know, if it's three o'clock, you'll hear three gongs. But when you get to the 15 minute mark, you'll hear two bells. And when you get to the half hour mark, you'll hear three bells. Is that right? Yeah. And when you get to the uh, uh, the next one, or is it, yeah, two bells, no, two bells, three bells, four bells. I believe that's correct. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but the point is, is that suddenly these quarter hours became important. 
And so that way you would know. And I've lived in Switzerland, uh, in the little town in uh, Weimar, a little village where there's a, uh, where there's a little village clock. And you could always tell kind of roughly where you were. Now, sometimes you would only hear two bells and you go like, oh, uh, oh, that's it. One bell is the, uh, now I've got it. Sorry. I'm remembering the bells. My memory is kicking in. One bell is the 15 minute. Two bells is the half hour. Three bells is the, uh, 45 minute mark and four bells, which isn't four bells, but it would be on a ship, I believe, is the, uh, uh, the top of the hour. So, but usually it, it, then you just get the bells of the, the, the actual uh, time of day. But sometimes you'd be walking around and you hear two bells and you're like, Oh, what hour is this? <laughs> you didn't really sure, but you had an idea that it was halfway around the, uh, the uh, hour, whatever it was. Um, and then, then you start to kind of look in the sky and figure things out. I like, uh, bells. I love bells, the sound of bells. And I like bell time, uh, public bell time to me is really fascinating because it's not precise. But with the introduction of the minute hand and a bit later, the second hand, you start entering into a very different world. Interestingly enough, the minute hand starts around 1700. And within a hundred years, the industrial revolution is going to start kicking into gear. And that minute hand is going to start to become very important. Um, and it's actually during this period that clocks went from being an ornament of the rich, because who could afford, afford a clock in your house? A clock in your house was not, uh, you didn't have yet the wristwatch and the pocket watch. Well, those were later inventions at the end of the uh, 19th century. But if you've ever seen old clocks that someone has in their house, they're ornamental. Uh, they are, they're made of, you know, bronze or, or, you know, they're, they sometimes they have gold and jewelry in them. There's a beautiful, uh, museum in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, of orology, horology, the, the study of clocks. And it's a clock museum. Now, of course, we're talking about Switzerland and the Swiss and are basically the best clock makers in the world. They had a lot of time in the winter. They'd make clocks. They got good at that sort of thing. They also got very good at the thing the clock produces, keeping schedules. I mentioned this last time about how a train in Switzerland, if it says it's leaving at uh, 10.52 in the morning, it's leaving at 10.52 in the morning, not 10.53. And that's pretty standard in Switzerland. I once stood at a Swiss train station where a train was five minutes late. And there was this really strange sense of unease among all the people waiting for the train because they're Swiss. They expect their trains to run on time. And they just, you just see people kind of slowly looking around. It's like something was going wrong with the universe. Well, nothing was going wrong with the universe. Uh, they were just much better than the trains in France still much and certainly far better than the trains in Italy which are hours and hours behind all the time, it seems. So, um, but interestingly enough, in the pre-French uh, Revolution period, there were factories. The factories were just starting to be formed. You know, some of the earliest factories were like soap factories and candle factories or uh, washing factories and things like this. Uh, practical things. But the way the factory worked, see, they didn't have the developed schedule yet. So the way the factory worked is you just kind of came in and worked for a while, contributed to the cause, and when you were done, you left, <laughs> which, of course, would strike anyone running a factory today as absolutely insane because you need everyone there on time to get things done, to be more efficient, uh, because that's what happened by the end of the Industrial Revolution. Um, interestingly enough, you have these people called the Luddites. There was a fictitious character called Ned Ludd who supposedly was, uh, breaking, uh, textile machinery and such because, uh, he didn't like the fact that machines were starting to create, uh, textiles and taking the work away from actual skilled laborers and producing essentially a lower inferior quality product. These days we all accept the lower inferior quality product like this piece of, of, uh, what is this? It's essentially a plastic based fabric imitating, uh, uh, cotton or wool. 
uh, in a plaid form. But it's you can see it's kind of bent because it's not really the real thing. Well, th we've all gotten used to bad synthetic uh, factory-made material. But the, the original Luddites, the people who invented uh, probably this character of Ned Ludd, uh, in the early 19th century in England, were smashing uh, uh, these textile machines because they felt it destroyed the value of their, uh, their labor and their skill. And they were right. Uh, we often talk today. Uh, eventually, the term Luddite became anyone who was like against... Uh, technology and machinery. Uh, but the truth is, the people who are smashing the machines really should have been looking somewhere else. What they should have been doing is ripping up the schedules, if they really wanted to understand. Unfortunately, they were short-sighted. They should have been smashing the factory clocks, because it is the clock and the schedule, which suddenly meant people could be paid for their time. What does that mean, to be paid for your time? And in fact, even today, the thing that all advertisers want from you is just seconds of your time, the more they can engage your time. This is also how politics works today. It's just anyone who can capture your time. So time became this thing which became a commodity. Well, it isn't really time. It's the schedule. It's the clock. But it is your valuable time. It is your time that's being taken. The Industrial Revolution needed more schedules. It needed more precise timekeeping. The Swiss and the English uh, became masters of the clocks more than anyone else. And uh, the English pocket watches became something which, and, and eventually led to the wristwatch, where you're actually strapping the device on your hand, the thing which cuts up the time. And I was supposed today, if it's just a, what they call an analog clock, to me it's just a clock, but <laughs> if, if you have an analog clock on your hand, that's kind of pretty now, because the digital clock is ruthless. And that's where we moved to. Eventually what happened was we had invented more precise uh, ways of keeping time. Digital, crystal, uh, nanoseconds. What the heck? You know, it's just like we divided time into more and more and more segments. Well, we didn't divide time. Time isn't divisible. But we measured it to the ability we could because if you're working with something like nuclear uh, uh, fission, you need to be pretty darn precise. If you're dealing with uh, light years, you need to be pretty precise. And so we invented more and more ways of dealing with, you know, how do you measure the speed of light? You need ways of dealing with these things. Now, that's fine as far as science goes. The problem is where we now literally have devices, well, they're not strapped to our wrists so much anymore as we hold them in our hands, and we constantly know what time it is. You know, and this thing isn't just like running off of uh, its own little m mechanism like a, a standard wristwatch does. It's constantly being updated by, uh, you know, uh, signals back to the towers, which keep the master time over uh, the GMT, Greenwich Mean Time, back in the UK. In other words, all the time is now precise around the world. What does that mean? And that's what we get to, is we get to this kind of almost absurdity of time. The absurdity is that we literally have schedules, like I said, uh, that where, where something is supposed to leave at, you know, a plane is supposed to leave at 7.33. Ha! <laughs> Did you ever get on a plane that left exactly on time? No. Why do they do that? Why do they give you even 7.35 or 7.45? Why do they do that? Because we're all brainwashed to think that that somehow means something. But it's absurd, that kind of living in time as if each second, it's like the problem is the more you think about seconds, you get into this fractal relationship. You can't even measure one, zero to one, because as soon as you start breaking down the measure, and this is a mathematical problem, uh, is that as soon as you start breaking it down, where do you break it down? It's like, okay, there's 
There's zero, there's half, there's one. Well, how about there's zero, point zero, point zero, point zero, point zero, one. Well, what about zero point, uh, zero, 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 one. And the more you divide it, the more you never get there. It becomes this absurdity as far as, I mean, it's good for mathematical equations. It's bad for life to measure your life that way. Kind of an interesting side note, in 2018, in the United Kingdom, uh, they've been taking the clocks, the old analog clocks, out of the schools. Why? The children don't know how to read them anymore, especially when they're taking tests. What does this tell us? Well, let's keep going a little bit further here. Let's talk about this. So one of the things that's happened because of the clock is that we then need devices. Uh, we need items that are here to be saving time. We call these convenience items. So whether it's a McDonald's hamburger or some sort of system for, uh, you know, a washing machine or whether we, you know, it's, it's something that saves us a few more miles of uh, gas. Time saving be has become a mania. But the truth is, there is a contradiction between saving time and keeping it. For one thing, you can't keep time. It's not a thing. Uh, therefore, you can't save time either. It's not a thing. So, it seems that the more we live by the schedule, the more the time becomes seen as a pressure. Like, time is passing. Well, it's because you're watching the clock. But time isn't actually passing. You're inside time. You are, you are moving within it, you know. Um, and again, there's an absurdity to all of this that we don't think about because the, the pressure of schedules and clocks upon us. It isn't time that's gone crazy. It's us that's gone crazy and our perspective on time. Convenience items are interesting because they say they're saving time but they end up only destroying the meaning of time. Uh, one thing I notice about living in Georgia is they don't have a lot of pre-processed, pre-prepared foods for sale. Um, they have a few frozen items, but they don't have endless frozen peas and corn. They don't have endless frozen uh, desserts. They don't have uh, stuff you just stick in the microwave and it's done. I mean, it's like a whole thing that they don't do here. They cook. What are you going to do? They like their food. It's really good. What are you going to do? Um, but that's the thing is we say, well, we save time by having these things you can just stick in a microwave and it's done. Now, they have done studies of people who, you know, prepare a full meal versus people who use microwave ovens regularly. And they've discovered there hasn't been that much extra time saved. I mean, like five minutes a day or something like that, believe it or not. Uh, and why? Because there's a lot more that goes on with that, that uh, processed food than you are actually looking at. You know, there is the, the garbage related to it. There is all the things of, of uh, you know, the way you're just buying it and picking it up and such. You're, and you're not really, well, then there's the problem of As you, you know, we don't want even the mac and cheese. I mean, someone wants that. We want the mac and cheese that's already made for us. And you just put it in and cook it. So here is, here's the problem. You are losing your relationship to food, which is something that happens in time. That's undeniable. Next, you're losing your relationship to nutrition. Because this food isn't as nutritious. It has to have, for instance, a lot of salt to preserve it. And you just check out the sodium levels of almost anything that's processed ahead of time. 
There is a lot of waste in the making of this food. Our time relationship is completely skewed. Whereas I can just take a piece of chicken and cook it. It doesn't take me long. I can do other things while I'm cooking it, you know, but to start with the, the chicken already purchased. I mean, this is why we like fast food too. But Jacques Ellul has an interesting thing. He says, time saved is empty time. So he's saying, you know, like in, on uh, the French roads, you know, they, instead of having the road do this winding around, they were doing this in Alaska when I left. They were cutting out these beautiful turns in the road where you could see these nice things to put this straight shot so that the big trucks could get through quicker. But Alul says this, and it's really fascinating. So, the time you save on your trip, what did you do with it? Did you do anything meaningful with it? Chances are you didn't. Maybe it gave you an extra hour to play on your video games, maybe, or watch television. You know, what did you do with the time you saved? And essentially, the saved time is extra time. Whereas, uh, conversely, the time spent cooking... Uh, one thing I always do when I invite people over to my house, uh, leave some cooking items undone so that people can help me finish the cooking job and we can talk. Because cooking and eating isn't just me sitting in front of a screen, which happens too much alone, but rather it's me with other people talking. That's what it should be. That's what it always traditionally has been for people. So, cars are interesting. They're like time travel devices, minus any real sense of time. I remember the first time I had a car, and then I had to get rid of it because I was going away, and suddenly I was left walking the same roads by foot. Now, I didn't see this the other way around, but once I got rid of the car, I suddenly, as I was walking through this environment, I suddenly saw it from a completely different vantage point and slower, and I knew it better by walking through it. That's what I mean. At, at time, it's a time travel device. It gets you there quicker, but it eliminates the effects of time while you do it. And, you know, I've taken long drives, quite a few. And, and American highways in particular are, you know, all the way through uh, North America are designed that you don't see anything. You just drive. It's just like you're in a tube shooting through. Might as well be on a plane, except planes are worse. Um, you know, they talk about the freedom of driving. Yeah, you're the, you have the freedom to stop at another roadside truck stop, which will have the same, you know, five uh, uh, establishments selling you food and bad uh, processed uh, goodies and uh, stickers and useless stuff you don't need for the most part. But think about traffic. I know what happens when you drive a car in Tbilisi here. You don't go anywhere because of the traffic. And interestingly enough, the traffic has gotten much worse the more people's economy has changed. So yeah, we have, uh, it's gotten a bit better, so now everyone can afford a cheap car. Well, we won't even talk about pollution. But the point is then there are accidents. Uh, there's a loss of human contact with a car. We're saving time and we're losing human contact. We're saving time and there are accidents. You know, Paul Virilio says the invention of the car is the invention also of the car crash. You know, um, we lose our connection with the natural world. Uh, I was briefly a tour manager for a rather odd, punkish kind of band back in the 1990s. And I was both a tour manager and sometime driver. And I can tell you how musicians relate to uh, their concerts these days. They drive all day. They arrive at a place, probably 5 or 6 o'clock in the afternoon. They spend a while setting up, doing a sound check. Then they go back. They eat. They rest. They wait to go on. It's a dark club often. You go on. You play, you're done at about midnight or later, maybe one in the morning. You're kind of amped up. You can't get to sleep. Eventually, you go to sleep late. You wake up. You do the whole thing. Or you drive all night. 
And here's the thing you're missing in that process. You have to do that in order to make any money whatsoever. You have to do that every day. So did you miss the part here where you're connecting with people? Yes, that's what's missing. You just become an event passing through. Again, the relationship of time is strange and absurd and how we relate to each other so that we become these passing points of light. Uh, travel has become the same way. The way we travel uh, with the internet and tourism, um, you know, air, airports, what kind of time suck is an airport? There are places in this world where you can literally take a train and get to your, uh, your uh, location faster than driving to the airport and waiting. Because that's how crazy airports are. But then the whole act of uh, flying in a plane has become, again, like this rather miserable time travel experience. So that you show up places and your body is lagged all over the place. And then the effect of tourism is also strange. It's the same as the traveling band I was just describing. You know, there are people who come to, say, Alaska. And uh, I watch them over and over. They're there for a day. Now, what do you really see in a day? If you're lucky, you see a bear. If you're lucky, you have a float down the river. If you're lucky, you meet one local for a moment, and you talk to them, and they go, really, you go fishing? Oh, how interesting. Tell us about the halibut. If you're lucky. Most people aren't that lucky when they travel. They don't connect with the place they're in. Even when they're on uh, their own private scheme and the handy-dandy time travel of the automobile, they're still not connecting. Because they have to look for the parking place. They have to, to watch out for things. And then they're free to just go as soon as they get bored. And Hans Ruckmacher in his lecture, What is Reality? Which I highly, highly, highly recommend. Said this, and you can find that on the Libri Ideas website. Hans Ruckmacher said, People are just chasing reality now. And as soon he says this, this is what he saw. And he said this back in the 1970s. It's much worse now. And he says, as soon as they have a danger of connecting with it, they leave. They go. They split. They're out of there. They're on to the next exciting thing. Or as another friend of mine, Steve Doughton, what's called the national parks in America. So many of them are just the Las Vegas of nature. You go see the geysers at Yellowstone. You go to see the Grand Canyon. You get this big wow. It's like a television screen for you. And your relationship in time to these things is strange and absurd. So I want to say this. Each new time-saving and keeping technique destroys more of time's meaning for us. Now, it's not to say we can't live without these things these days. However, we have to act consciously. Owen Barfield calls this final participation. Whereas it says in the past, you know, people just naturally connected with the environment. They naturally saw the meaning in everything. Almost too much meaning. You know, spirits in the trees and such. Well, now we live in a world where people tell us there are no spirits in the trees, except some people who want to believe in spirits in the trees. But the point is this. We, what used to be natural, uh, singing songs while you work, that used to be natural. Uh, uh, it used to be natural that everything was connected. Well, now it's not natural at all for contemporary humanity and wherever the modern world has seeped into the what used to be natural is now completely unnatural and the only way to make it uh work anymore the relation our relationships in time is you have to choose to make it and if you don't choose it won't happen now there are still a few things in which uh the natural world still reminds us of our relationship with time and like I say, in cold weather countries, you feel winter coming. In warm weather countries, you feel maybe the, the monsoon rains or something coming. There are these signs, you know, the hurricane is coming. It's hurricane season. What does that mean? But if you want to connect with time, you have to remember this. All time is personal. And by personal, I do not mean private. 
It's not my personal little relationship at the time. Nor do I mean it's arbitrary. It's whatever you want it to be. No, it isn't. You're going to get stuck by reality if you think that's true. It's like, I often look at it as kind of like a, the rubber band on a slingshot. You can pull and pull and pull things until you think like, well, I can do whatever I want. Eventually, it's going to snap back. And when it does, it's going to smash into you because or smash into the culture. Um, nor is it personal doesn't mean it's just subjective. In the sense of, you know, again, my subjective, you know, relativistic experience. And I would, and to back this up scientifically, I would say this. Michael Polanyi's book, Personal Knowledge. If you are interested in any kind of scientific ideas you want to back, and you want me to back up what I'm saying about time being personal, go read his book from the late 1950s, I believe it was, Personal Knowledge. It's a difficult book. It's a hard book. It's an amazing book in the way he defines it. In other words, even science isn't devoid of the personal. As much as they would like to claim, it's completely objective. It isn't. And there are good reasons for that, and he lays that out in his book, Personal Knowledge, Michael Polanyi. Now, some of you might be scientifically inclined and might have been grinding your teeth as I talk about personal knowledge. Again, I point to Michael Polanyi, or personal time, time being personal. I point to Michael Polanyi. But we'll discuss a bit of the science behind this next time. Again, I'm not a scientist, but I have been thinking about these things and weighing and measuring them. I have done some scientific reading. I'm not, I'm not just going, I'm not just inventing these ideas, you know, out of my, uh, just whatever I feel. I have good reasons for what I believe. So, anyway... Let's call it quits for now. And thank you if you've been listening this far to me go on and on about time. Hopefully you will think about your own relationship to to, to time and how you do things. Do you need to buy that, uh, you know, banquet TV dinner? Or can you just make something at home? You know, do you need to, to uh, uh, drive somewhere when you can walk? Uh, do you need to... Go on a vacation to Europe for two weeks. What does that mean? It's like it's like a reality shift. Uh, when can you go for longer? Can you get? Do you have to travel every day, or can you go to one place and stay and and form a relationship in time with these places? These are the kind of things I'm asking you to think about. I'm not saying, you know. Uh, travel on a bus through Europe uh, where you see something different every day is bad. I'm just simply saying there are better ways of better ways of understanding how the world we live in. And uh, I am reminded of a parable of a young boy who was at a went to a university. This is just a parable. I don't know if it ever happened. Went to a university and all he ever knew. Uh, about orange type drinks was things like Tang, remember the powdered drink, or Kool Aid, or uh, Fanta, you know, uh, or, you know, these orangey soda drinks. And one day someone sat him down and said, Well, you've never had real orange juice. He goes, No. He goes, like, Well, you should buy it. And he points to uh, the things in the store, the Tropicana uh, containers, or those little, uh, in America, we have the frozen cans of uh, concentrated orange juice. And so he, he gets these things and he goes like, wow, that is so good. It's so much better than that other stuff, that, that really weird imitation orange stuff. And then one day, someone sees him drinking this stuff and he goes like, why are you drinking that? He goes like, I really like orange juice. He goes like, really? Well, why don't you try real orange juice? He goes, well, what do you mean? This is real orange juice. It says right on the label, real orange juice. He goes like, no. He says, go buy some oranges. I like to keep my oranges cold, you know, put them in the freezer for a while and then squeeze them and then fill up a half a glass or a glass of that and then just drink it. And he does. And he's never tasted anything so good. It tastes nothing like the orange juice sold as real orange juice in the stores. And it's a million miles away from the thing called, you know, the, these sodas and artificial drinks. And it's just real, really good. Well, that's what I'm saying the relationship is time in, with time is like. You know, you can have this 
relationship to time that's all through the media, through the screen, completely unreal, completely strange, weird pressures on your life of when to do things. Or you can go out and work a job nine to five, or maybe you get a better job where you're not on the clock so much, and you get to actually do something that's interesting and meaningful to you. Or you can learn to live within time every day, which is the thing which, sadly, our world today prevents us from doing so often. But it can be done. And at least you can find some way to do that, to bring meaning to the things in life. Because meaning and time are completely related. Time is inside of meaning. Meaning is inside of time. Next time, we'll talk more about the relationship of science and time. And I hope you find that interesting. Well, like I say, subscribe, smite like, share this if you find this interesting. Uh, I really could use more subscribers because I'm trying to build up a certain base level of uh, people who are part of this. I need it for my uh, income out here in the middle of where am I? Am I in Europe or Asia? I'm in the middle of it. I feel like I'm at this point that's a, everything spins around. And there's a lot to be said for that, being in the Caucasus Mountains here. But, uh, yeah, and if you're so inclined, do become a uh, a paying friend through uh, PayPal. And uh, I will get you that extra material, which you know you want. Well, this is Burn. Thanks for listening, and I will be seeing you again soon. Yeah, I know I've been taking a while and getting back to the next uh, How We Got Here one because it's the most complicated one, and I just want to make sure that when I do it, I do it right, and it's the one that will get me in the most trouble if I get it wrong. But meanwhile, I'll see you soon, and remember, swim back upstream the anadromous life. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.